Hello, my name is Fabian Hassler. I'm working at the RW2H University in Aachen. Today I will present you some information about how to obtain the topological invariance if you are provided with a specific Hamiltonian. Let us first recapitulate some basic facts about the topological properties of a gapped Hamiltonian which we have learned so far. Two Hamiltonians are in the same topological class if you can find a way to smoothly transform one Hamiltonian into the other without closing the gap. Such operations are called deformations of the Hamiltonian. The problem here is that you have to test for all conceivable ways how you could possibly deform a Hamiltonian into the other one. This is a hard to impossible task to do in practice. So here is where the notion of the topological invariance come into the game. You have seen that two Hamiltonians have the same topological invariance if they are in the same class. Now, instead of testing for all possible ways to transform a Hamiltonian into another one, it seems to be much simpler to test if the topological invariants are the same. However, for that we need to have a simple way to determine the topological invariance given a specific Hamiltonian, which is the task of today's lecture. You might wonder why you should care about the topological invariance in the first place. In order to understand the importance of the topological invariance, you should remember the basic fact originating from the bulk boundary correspondence that bringing two materials with distinct topological indices together a well-defined number of surface states are formed at the interface. Those surface states are the origin of all the excitement about the topological classification of insulators as they are insensitive to disorder as long as the topological invariants of the bulk do not change. So for weak to moderate disorder, those surface states are insensitive to imperfections which are unavoidably present in any experiment. To understand some of the difficulties which arise in the determination of topological invariance, let us look at a simple example of a one-dimensional system with a sublattice symmetry, a system which is called in class A3. In the simplest situation, such a system has two bands, one for each sublattice. We can write a general Hamiltonian for a system with two bands in the following form, where tau act on the sublattice degree of freedom. The sublattice symmetry now demands that the Hamiltonian anticommute with tau c, which leaves us with the two remaining terms proportional to tau x and tau y. The prefactors alpha x and alpha y we can draw in a two-dimensional plane. Deforming the Hamiltonian corresponds to changing the prefactors. We look at the evolution of the prefactors as a function of the single momentum variable which is present in 1D. This traces out the red curve in the two-dimensional plane which is closed, as the momentum is periodic in the Brea zone. Because we only allow for gapless Hamiltonians, we are not allowed to traverse the origin of the plane. Curves in a plane without the origin are characterized by the topological invariant, which is the sign binding number. You see example of curves with binding number 0 on the left and 1 on the right. You have learned about the binding number already in the lecture about the Thaulis pump. It is easy to see that this binding number cannot change without closing the gap, which corresponds to the curve going through the origin. In the most naive approach, if you want now to determine the topological invariant, you might start by looking at the Hamiltonian close to the center of the Brea zone. Evaluating the Hamiltonian at the orange sample points, you might get the following information. It is clear that this is not enough to determine the topological invariant. This is no surprise as the invariant is a topological quantity and having information only about a small part of the Brea zone is obviously not enough to determine this quantity. So you might try to include more and more points in the Brea zone and obtain the following picture. Now you might already have a good guess what the binding number will be. Until you look at the remainder of the momentum values and to your surprise the binding number is in fact zero. What you should have learned from this simple example is that you will have to look at all momentum variables in order to determine the topological invariant. 
As the problem at each momentum variable will involve solving an eigenvalue or a sketching problem, your computer will have to run a very, very long time until you have collected all the necessary information, which allows you to determine the invariant. In higher dimension, your task will even become more difficult, as there are much more momentum variables to take into account. It is thus essential to have a more clever way to attack the problem, which you will learn in the following.